For many people, this is Rhode Island architecture, what you'd take your brother-in-law to see if he came to visit. This is where Cornelius Vanderbilt and his guests turned their backs on America and looked out towards Europe, where the inspiration for this mansion came from. This is the Breakers in Newport, and by any standard, it's a great building. But you can't get a good hamburger at the Breakers. This is the modern diner. Built of stainless steel, wood, and formica, its design is American as a fast train to Chicago. Frankie and his cousin Emil stop here for breakfast every morning on their way to the factory. Vinny clinched a deal at the next table to pour 10 yards of concrete. And over there, Mary told her boyfriend she'd love him forever if he'd just give her a bite of his french fries. But the Breakers and the Modern Diner do have one thing in common. They're both on the National Register of Historic Places, a sort of who's who of American building. And each is a part of what it means to live here. Could I have some uh, vinegar over here, please? I'm David McCauley. Join us as we discover why the architecture of Rhode Island gives all of us who live here a very special sense of place. When I was growing up in England, like most children, I didn't really think about architecture. I loved building models and forts, but the only test of a real building, a house or a train station or a castle, was what it felt like. Was it fun to be in or wasn't it? Later, when I studied architecture in Rhode Island, I learned why my forts fell down and the real castles didn't. But I never lost a sense of delight in different kinds of buildings from different periods. I stayed on here to write and illustrate books about how they built castles and cathedrals, pyramids and skyscrapers. And as I looked around in my own backyard, I discovered how rich Rhode Island architecture is, how it's given a special character to the state. We could begin anywhere, but let's start in Newport. A fellow named Stephen Mumford built this house himself in 1675, not very long after the colony was founded. Poor Mumford. He lived here for 50 years, but do people call this the Mumford House? No. It's the Wanton Lyman Hazard House, named after three later owners. But by any name, it's one of the oldest buildings in Newport, and certainly one of the finest 17th century houses in all of New England. It's a simple plan, two rooms to a floor, one on either side of the central chimney. In the no-nonsense 17th century, this would have been the kitchen, the heart of the house. There would have been a massive fireplace here, continuously in use for cooking and heating. That's been covered up by this smaller, demure, 18th century fireplace and mantel, with its rare Delft tiles from Holland. One of the most fascinating things about this house is that it's been restored so that some of the details from each period have been maintained. It's something like an archaeological dig with the various layers exposed. During this period, buildings were supported by huge wooden posts and beams. Here in this upstairs room, you can see the timber framing. Most of the structure was exposed like this. The huge corner posts, shaped like gun stocks and solidly braced, would have been visible proof of what was holding the house up. This house was never a mansion. It was a simple, straightforward building erected at the beginning of Newport's rise to success. And unlike the handful of other 17th century Newport houses, it's still here, in virtually its original form. Across the street in 1699, a truly remarkable building was taking shape, 
the Quaker Meeting House. This was the first meeting house in the colonies and a building of truly surprising scale and importance. It was to house the first yearly meeting of the new century that this grand house was constructed. It is said that 3,000 Quakers gathered here in that spring of 1700, which is an astonishing number when you consider that the population of Newport was only 9,000. Quakers didn't believe in ministers. And even though the church elders sat up front on benches facing the others, anyone could sit up there if he or she felt inwardly moved to do so. It was meant to be a community of spirit. And so there was no architectural focus in the design, no single center. What else does this building say to us, other than that it is a remarkably astounding solution to the problem of essentially an early convention center? It is, in fact, an astonishing assertion of freedom expressed in architecture. The size of this building, the confidence with which the builders framed the airy central space, the scale, and the simplicity of the design and furnishings all these elements express, in a wooden structure, what we know from other evidence. The Quakers were more than tolerated here. They were at home. And like Newport, they were thriving. This is what the original building may have looked like. A domestic form, a barn perhaps. It looks simple to us now. But to some of those early Quakers visiting from outside Rhode Island, even this design with its decorative cupola was much too fancy. The Quaker Meeting House and the synagogue that Peter Harrison designed for Newport's Jews later in the 18th century are the rarest of birds. The wonder is not that they're so successful, but that they exist at all. They are architectural embodiments of Rhode Island's tolerance. And here, across town, another religious minority was raising its church. Remember that New England was settled by dissenters, people who broke away from the established church. But Rhode Island was founded by dissenters from the dissenters, like Roger Williams, fanatics of tolerance. So there was even room here for members of the mother church, the Church of England. In 1725, Trinity Church was built. Today, it seems like a symbol of Newport, a postcard image of a New England church. It's worth remembering that the form of this building was not a native plant, but a hothouse flower, imported directly from London. When London was destroyed in the Great Fire of 1666, the architect Christopher Wren was given the job of rebuilding the city's churches, over 60 of them. Trinity Church was almost certainly built from one of Wren's plans, made available to the building committee here by the Church of England as part of its missionary program. Wren's original church would have been made of stone. Trinity Church is a remarkable translation of those forms into wood. The pulpit here has been moved from its normal position on the side wall to the center of the aisle. And what an elegant pulpit it is, in the shape of a wine glass, with two smaller desks reaching in front. The minister is the center of this design, with the sounding board above his head to ensure that not a single word is lost. Presidents, royalty, and Nobel laureates have all worshipped here. But a former tavern keeper, whose pew is right in the back, made it all possible. His name was Richard Mundy. He built this church and was Newport's first architect and builder whose name has come down to us. This church that Richard Mundy built is a strong and graceful statement about order and symmetry and finally about authority. Newporters were beginning to see themselves less as colonists than as equal members of the British Empire. Paradoxically, the more they embraced English forms and fashions, the greater their disappointment when Britain treated them shabbily. And they were about to be treated very shabbily indeed. During the first three years of the Revolution, the British occupied Newport. They used Trinity Church as a stable, and they burnt one-third of the city's houses. The Patriots fled when the British moved in. The Tories fled when the British moved out. And in between, the Quakers drifted off. 
Newport wouldn't recover for a century. But her bad luck was Providence's good fortune, and the city at the head of the bay was poised to take advantage of it. At the time of the Revolutionary War, this Providence was really getting underway as one of the great cities. It had been growing in, in strength during the 18th century. After the Revolutionary War, uh, Newport had lost its hold on the financial character of the state, and Providence had never had that break. Uh, during the war because it didn't lose its revolutionary, its original population. If you were living in Providence in the 18th century, early 18th century, and you looked down on North Main Street, you would have looked to the west and have seen a big cove of water. And across the cove, you would have sent, seen open farmlands. Then along the Main Street itself, you would see the little houses, the one, little one and two story, uh, framed houses with steep pitched roofs that made up the first street of Providence. And John Brown and Brown and Ives and Carrington and uh, the Russells and the great manufacturing and banking companies were making history for themselves that is still part of the American financial history. Even by the end of the 18th century, there were no professional architects in Rhode Island. But John Brown didn't have to look far to find someone to build him a new house. His brother Joseph had already built the first Baptist church on North Main Street and University Hall here at Brown. Joseph had taste, he had intelligence, and what's more, he owned the English architectural books from which the design was taken. The form of the house was simple, a familiar 18th century plan. Four rooms around a central staircase. Only the scale had changed. But what a change. These spacious, high-ceilinged rooms expressed in their size and decorative detail the confidence that Providence's merchant princes felt in this last decade of the 18th century. Traders, bankers, shippers, investors, Brown and his associates were visibly in touch with the larger world. The original wallpaper was printed in Italy, and on the dining room table, the china really was from China. Export ware brought back from the Orient on one of John Brown's ships. At first, John Brown's house stood in magnificent isolation on Powers Lane, above Benefit Street. But over the next two decades, the Brown family could look out their windows and watch the mansions of other wealthy merchants rising around them. They were variations of Brown's basic plan, a three-story house with a hip roof. The Thomas Point and Ives house just up the hill was built of brick like John Brown's house, but its detailing was less robust, more delicate. On William Street, Edward Carrington bought and enlarged this house as a reward for spending nine lonely but profitable years in China. And the Nightingale house was a more elaborate rendition in wood of the basic plan. These were four of the most elegant houses built during the early days of the American Republic, loosely grouped around each other in a circle of friendly mimicry. Upstairs, here at the John Brown House, a room has been set aside as a kind of memorial to another of the Brown brothers, a man who might not always have been welcomed here, Moses Brown. Years before, he had become a Quaker, and although he took his religion seriously, at one point he sued his brother John for trading in slaves, there was nothing in his faith that prevented a man from turning a profit. He saw that if great fortunes could be made in shipping, great fortunes could be lost there as well. At the end of the century, Moses had his eye on a new kind of business, one that would change the shape of the way people worked and how they lived. A sense of place will continue. This was to be the sound of the new century, at first hundreds, then thousands of turning wheels, belts, shuttles, and spindles. We just fought a revolution, and now we were about to import one. Some say steal it from England, where a water-powered system had been developed for spinning cotton. For some time, Moses Brown and his Quaker friends here had been struggling to launch an American textile industry. Brown had the money. He even had copies of all the English machines. But what he needed was someone who knew how to operate them. 
Enter Samuel Slater, a young, ambitious English immigrant who had spent seven years learning how to manage a textile business. Brown's money and Slater's expertise created America's first factory system, just above the Pawtucket Falls, here on the Blackstone River. In the construction of a textile mill, it was necessary to have a source of water power. They had to build this small dam here, which is above the natural falls in the river. The tower of the mill and its neoclassical cupola were later additions. The tower provided space for a stairway. You could move the stairway out to the tower to save room in the primary manufacturing areas. The bell on the top of the tower uh, was added later uh, as part of the cupola. And it provides a way of calling the workers to come in the morning, perhaps announcing the lunch hour or the end of the day. Windows are very important in a textile mill because they provide natural light for manufacturing. The width of the mill influences how much natural light reaches the machinery and the workers. The critical element of a mill was its power source. In this case, the prime mover was a large water wheel. Water wheels were difficult to construct. They had to be shielded from the elements, and they performed an important role in delivering power into the manufacturing areas. The sound of the water wheel and the bell. Between those notes, the lives of the mill workers vibrated. Although the work was hard and sometimes dangerous, even the young sons and daughters of the mill owners worked here in the beginning. Later, as more laborers were needed, the owners built housing, schools, and a company store in an attempt to create a closed community whose center was the mill. The way Samuel Slater organized his machines and his workers was the model for 50 years of industrial development. Perhaps one difference, by the time this mill at Ashton was built, was that the workers were more and more seen to be a part of the machinery, replaceable and interchangeable parts. Here was the mill, bigger and more imposing than before. If business was the new religion of America, then here was its church and its steeple, and across the street, all of its people and company houses. In the early mill villages like Slatersville and Peacedale, the worker housing was made of wood. Here at Ashton, it's made of brick. And these houses on their sturdy granite foundations show just how much the owners put into what today we would call employee relations. You know those highway billboards? If you lived here, you'd be home by now? Well, this was the original. This was the architecture of the new century, before public transportation. Small living units built as closely as possible to the central factory or mill. In the countryside, the houses were separate. In the booming cities, they were often stacked on top of each other. It made for dependence, certainly, but it also created strong neighborhoods of people whose jobs and backgrounds drew them together. But if this was the future, there were still ambitious Rhode Islanders at the beginning of the century who were struggling to hold on to the past and the old, dirty ways of making a living. George DeWolf and his family had been slave traders in Bristol for generations. But George refused to give up the profitable business, even after it had become unpopular and then illegal. In 1810, he commissioned a house from Bristol's best young architect, Russell Warren. This wedding cake of a house was an ingenious, flamboyant answer to the simple three-story mansions of Providence's merchants. Columns with Corinthian capitals soared two stories on the exterior, and Russell added arches and porches and wooden detailing to hide the basically square, familiar shape. Inside, a spiral stairway rises four stories through the heart of the house. The rooms around it are surprisingly simple. George DeWolf was a privateer, a slaver, and a speculator, and like his business, his house is all facade. In 1825, his financial empire collapsed almost overnight, and with it, the economy of Bristol. Wealthy men who had depended on DeWolf became day laborers or peddled clams in the street. The banks lost half their capital. The town was suddenly no place for what we would today call a society architect. And so, on the ill wind that blew through Bristol, Russell Warren left for Providence and to a commission that would result in one of America's classic buildings. Strangely enough, a war in the corner of Europe was to have a profound effect on American architecture. In the 1820s, Greece was fighting for her independence, and the eyes of sympathetic Americans were drawn to that country, and to publications that described for the first time the classical beauty of ancient Greek architecture. 
Greek columns, porticos, and pediments suddenly seemed the most appropriate facade for schools and churches, like Manning Chapel at Brown University, or for libraries like the Providence Athenaeum. America, struggling to find its identity as a new republic, had found an architectural style that was both democratic and dramatic. Private houses took the same forms and translated them into wood. Every man's house was no longer his castle, now it was his temple. And it was Russell Warren with his partner James Bucklin who built the first Greek revival building in Providence and one of the best in America. The Providence Arcade was a daring experiment in architecture and in commerce. There were arcades and gallerias in Europe, but the idea of a covered street of shops had never been tried here. And Providence wasn't even officially a city in 1828. And it already had its own temple to the gods of retail. It was an experiment that failed, an idea ahead of its time. The department store was going to be the popular American retail form for the rest of the century. But 150 years later, millions of Americans would spend their Saturdays milling through the arcade's descendants, the artificial streetscape of the modern mall. Today's malls are usually buildings with insides, but no outsides. You have to drive around for half an hour just to find the entrance. But ever since it was built, entering the arcade has been a part of the drama. From either Way Bossett or Westminster Streets, you entered through a grand portico with huge columns of Johnston granite, the largest in America when they were quarried. Walking through this shadowed, massive porch into the interior, where the space leaps three stories to the skylight, is one of the great experiences in Rhode Island architecture. Behind the gray facade, the building has a heart of light. The arcade was a symbol of Providence's new downtown, across Waybosset Neck on the west side of the river. It was boom time in the city, fueled by the profits from the textile industry, some of which went into architecture, and some of which went into the building of canals and railroads. By 1847, the city needed a train station where the tracks converged on Exchange Place, just south of the cove, which still dominated the landscape. It was a difficult project, but the building that rose there would be considered the best early train station in the United States. It was designed by a freshman at Brown University. Thomas Teft, once a poor school teacher in Richmond, Rhode Island, was a 21-year-old student and an architect's apprentice when he began designing this building, the Union Depot. From his library of architectural books, he drew together the basic elements of this plan. Two tall towers from northern Italy, two flanking arcades with round arches from Germany, but combined here in a way that was all his own. The long building curving to hug the cove and rising to define and dominate Exchange Place. For an architect at the end of his career, it would have been a remarkable building, but Teft had only begun. During the next 10 years, Teft designed an astonishing variety of domestic and commercial buildings, schoolhouses, libraries, and churches, deftly combining Romanesque and Renaissance motifs. For the mill owner, Robert Lippitt, Teft created a Providence townhouse of severe simplicity. In the Tully Bowen house, he was bolder, contrasting the projecting corner blocks with the smooth wall surface. As a guide to the stonecutters, he made drawings for each individual block of the sandstone facade. He loved to explore the decorative possibilities of brick, as he did here in this molding on the Second Universalist Church in Providence. A young man with a fierce ambition and energy, Teft wanted to see firsthand the buildings in England, France, and Germany that he only knew on paper. While he was on a grand tour of Europe, Teft died at the age of 33. So we'll never know what kinds of buildings this difficult, brilliant artist might have made had he returned. This might be the best place to take our leave of him, at the old South Ferry Baptist Church in Narragansett. It's a wonderful sight, overlooking the bay, and what a sweet building Teff designed for it when he was only 25. It's as if he'd arranged a friendly conversation between different forms and traditions, a Wren church from London, a New England meeting house, and bits of detail from 11th and 12th century Europe. And then he'd enlivened the surface with hexagonal shingles, hand-sawed by one member of the congregation. Here was Teft's genius, not in mimicking European forms, but in adapting them and translating them into brick and wood in pursuit of an American architecture, an American language of building. A 
A Sense of Place will continue. This is Providence City Hall, a symbol of the city's pride and success during the 19th century. In some ways, it's a wonder it ever got built. In 1845, Providence decided to build itself a city hall. So a committee was appointed, three members from the original town across the river and three members from the new commercial center, three and three. Providence politics being what it is, it only took 30 years to decide on a site. The new downtown emerged the winner. Samuel Thayer, a Boston architect, won a national competition for the design. What he gave the city was a building inspired by the Second Empire in France, a fashionable form that would have seemed very much at home on the boulevards of Paris. A French design built on what used to be a tidal marsh on a site formerly occupied by a theater and an opera house. Just the right foundation, some might say, for Providence City Hall, but it's inside that the fun begins. The building looks severe and imposing from the outside, but the interior is as colorful as a Romanian circus. Look at the scale of the rooms. The council chamber is three stories high, with gold stenciling at the top and bottom of the pilasters. In the alderman's chamber, light wood wainscoting and stenciled patterns break up and particularize the feel of the large space. If nothing else, it gave the council members something to look at when their attention wandered during a meeting. The city government moved here from cramped rooms in the old market house along the river. Imagine how different this must have felt. city hall be this grandiose, this ornate? Well, look at what the building says. It says, here is a city that can be taken seriously, a city that has arrived. And what else does it do? Well, there are seldom unexpected encounters in a building like this. You could see your constituents coming a long way off and have some time to decide what to say to them. This is architecture which reminds the politicians and the people who elect them that they're all the same size and part of something much larger. This building is an embodiment of the city in space and color. By the end of the 19th century, the simple mill buildings had been replaced by giant complexes that made Rhode Island an industrial and manufacturing center. The captains of this new mercantile prosperity built their own houses as symbols of their success and taste and they found land available on the streets that radiated west from the center of Providence. In the years between the Civil War and the end of the century, these boulevards would become the fashionable entrances to downtown Providence. On Broadway, this is what you could have built with $20,000 in 1867, the Kendrick House overlooking Olneyville. Its basic form is that of an Italian villa, believe it or not, but the tower and the bracketed ornament on every surface make it seem more like a wedding cake. Down the street, a few years later, a wealthy provisioner named Colin Baker built another double house. This distinctive roof shape, called Mansard after a French architect, is one design detail that marks this as a French Second Empire design, an extrapolation of the forms that made up the Providence City Hall. Department store owner John Troop built this Gothic revival house in 1867, lived in it a year or two, and then built himself an even larger house across the street. Troop's second house was in the more fashionable Queen Anne style. It's a picturesque combination of small details tied together by bold, large forms, like the spacious veranda circling the first floor. The Francis Trowbridge house down the street, also in the Queen Anne style, is another variation on a form that would influence much of Providence's domestic architecture for the next 60 years. Most of the men who built these houses had made their own fortunes, 
They were supervisors of mills and railways, merchants and retailers of prosaic things like paint, button hooks, lumber, and plumbing. So these houses, with their bays and porches and towers, expressed the pride of their owners in a material success that could be touched and felt and lived in. Here, their families enjoyed privacy and space and an exuberant Victorian delight in the multiplicity of the world. On the side streets, however, it was a different story. Providence was the first American address for thousands of immigrants fleeing from Great Britain and Europe in the 19th century. They were needed here as workers in the mills and foundries, but their lives were hard. Their children worked either in the factories or on the margins of a prosperous middle-class economy. This young girl is collecting human hair from barber shops to be used in pillows and jewelry, and the most destitute foraged in the West Exchange Street dump near today's Civic Center. Some housing in the city was still provided by the mill owners. These are the triple-deckers along the side streets off Broadway in the heart of Federal Hill. The Irish were here first, then in the 1880s, the Italians. The houses were set with their narrowest dimensions facing the street. This was the simplest way of cramming more buildings onto the available land. At their worst, the triple-deckers were cheap, often without indoor plumbing. At their best, in neighborhoods around Smith Hill, they provided spacious housing for the workers who walked down the hill to their jobs at the Brown and Sharp Complex or the Corliss Iron Works. The wealthy had their gardens and summer homes, but the working people needed an escape from the treeless streets and the overcrowded neighborhoods. At the end of the trolley lines along Elmwood Avenue and Broad Street, the city had provided some remarkable relief. Roger Williams Park began its life as a hundred acres of meadow, marsh, and scrubland on the Cranston border. During the last years of the 19th century, it became one of the most important planned environments in Rhode Island. Acquired by the city in the 1870s, the park grew from 100 acres to more than 400, but its crucial early direction was shaped by noted landscape architect H.S.W. Cleveland. Cleveland produced a design that elegantly combined the natural and the man-made. He drained a swamp to create artificial ponds, and he sculpted paths and roadways to provide near views and far vistas. The idea was to follow the natural contours as closely as possible, but to improve upon nature, to make an artificial landscape look natural and unplanned. Is this architecture? Probably at its purest. It was an environment that was planned and shaped and maintained to fulfill essential needs. Not shelter, but enjoyment. Not profit, but public well-being. The measure of the success of this design space is the affection that its users have had for it. And it's especially appropriate that it was a descendant of Roger Williams who bequeathed the land to the city. By the end of the 19th century, nobody told wimp jokes about Rhode Island. We were the sixth largest industrial power in the country. But there was something missing. There was no central seat of state administration. Rhode Island needed a symbol of its heady leap into the 20th century. Planners looked at a site on a hill overlooking the city, Jefferson Parade Ground, a favorite spot for picnics and outings. Most of us see this building today as a large and elaborate uh, building, uh, but we have to remember what this looked like in the early 1890s, not as we see it today. Uh, this building, though large, uh, was for the early 1890s, for the late 19th century, uh, was a very severe, very uh, plain building. And what, what was striking about it, what captured the, fan the, the fancy of, of Americans at that time, was this vision of a, a building, a very simple, chaste, Renaissance-inspired building. This building as a sort of leader building, as a, uh, a building that set the example for state houses, is appropriate for Rhode Island, which was then one of the most populous uh, one of the most heavily industrialized, one of the wealthiest states in the country. The choice of McKim, Mead and White as architects for the State House was not surprising. McKim, Mead and White were certainly no strangers to Rhode Island. The New York-based firm had a number of clients who built summer houses in Rhode Island, in Narragansett and in Newport. Newport had been enjoying its own renaissance in the heady years after the Civil War. As far back as the 18th century, the city had been a summer resort, but now it became the fashionable place to see, to be seen, and to build. Along Bellevue Avenue, a new world of buildings arose. Their millionaire owners called them cottages. The architect of choice, the society architect of the period, was Richard Morris Hunt. Hunt
Hunt was the first American architect to have studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in France, and for a price, he could build you anything. If Walt Disney had designed a theme park of European architecture, he couldn't have done any better. These mansions are great fun to visit, but they tend to overwhelm us. Partly it's because we don't see the staff of 20 servants who would run the places, keeping the statues dusted and the champagne cool. And partly because they weren't really meant to be lived in. They were stage sets, bits of theater design in which you entertained your friends and impressed yourself with your good taste. But just down the street, another kind of architecture had been developing in the years following the Civil War. It used American materials, it was more human in scale, and it was to produce some of the most important buildings of the 19th century. Builders no longer framed their structures with heavy timbers. They used a cheaper, lightweight, flexible system of two-by-fours nailed together. Instead of concealing the structure within the walls, they let it show in what became known as the stick style. The Griswold House, now the Newport Art Museum, illustrates the results. In the Watts Sherman House, H. H. Richardson, another great architect of the age, takes the form of an English manor house and wraps it in bands of windows, giving the surface a continuity new in America. The exterior seems to function like a decorative skin, enclosing the volume of the space inside. So the movement towards simple masses and forms held together by a sinuous surface and the sense of the interior flowing naturally into the outdoors, these led to what we today call the shingle style. It's been described as an orchestration of light and space, the final expression of organic wooden structure. But the purest expression of the new architecture was not a house at all, but a one-of-a-kind building, the Newport Casino. You and I probably wouldn't have gotten past the front door in 1881. This place was a very exclusive country club. But today, it's open to the public, and we can see for ourselves what these fresh new spaces felt like. American architects were still borrowing, but they were combining elements in a new way. Tucked comfortably into the roof line, as if it's grown there, is a form that might have come from the Loire Valley in France, a squat clock tower with an oversized face. And these sweeping curved piazzas, with their open screen work and posts, were partially inspired by Japanese design, but they're married here in a uniquely American way. The enclosed spaces are low, human in scale, and flow horizontally. Bays and piazzas welcome the outdoors, but break it up into a series of manageable views. And everything is held together by the marvelous liquid quality of the shingled surface and broad, comforting roof. Wherever it can, the building experiments with space, structure, and with the surface textures of the walls. The mansions represented a kind of American suburb, but their designs look backwards towards European models. Here at the Newport Casino, the shingle style looked forward. Its basic elements gave American builders and architects an inventive, organic vocabulary that would carry them well into the 20th century. A sense of place will continue. Over there, along the east side of the river, is the oldest part of Providence, the oldest part of the state. And over here, they're moving rivers to make way for a new generation of buildings. sometimes a difficult balancing act between preserving the forms of the past and building for the future. In the 20th century, for most Rhode Islanders, that was a choice they really didn't have. Like much of the industrial Northeast, Rhode Island slid gradually into a depression after the First World War. Few people knew or cared about the state's architectural heritage. In the 1930s and 40s, a visitor to Rhode Island would have found neglected towns and battered cities. Then, in the 1950s, Brown University began to expand. Veterans were returning to college, and Brown began to clear land for new dormitories in the heart of College Hill. Dozens of historic houses were raised, and the community responded by forming the Providence Preservation Society. Soon there was another threat to the decaying houses along Benefit Street, the bag ladies of Rhode Island architecture. 
they were about to be swept off the street by the federal government. The process was euphemistically called urban renewal. What it meant was that aging neighborhoods in American cities were bulldozed to make way for new development and for the automobile. What the process did to the neighborhood and to the people who lived there was usually not part of the equation. The relocation agency was very slow in finding homes for the non-whites in the neighborhood. In moving out of Lippert Hill area, I've been very fortunate in relocating myself on my own initiative. Had I waited for the relocation agency to find me a place in which to live, I would have been probably out in South Providence or somewhere uh, way out of my uh, territory. I have lived on the east side here for quite some time, since 1908. And it would have created hardship on me personally to have gone in some other direction. Of course, although I have been fortunate as an individual, my family and I, there has been hardship on quite a few of the non-white who lived in the area. But now the people who cared about preserving the past were ready. Using funds from the same program that would have torn the buildings down, they did a survey of what was worth saving. They discovered that the east side of Providence was not just an 18th century community. It was a wonderful tapestry of house styles, and they decided to try to save the entire fabric. They didn't want to embalm the area. They wanted to make it a living part of the city once again. In the middle of the fight to save College Hill was a woman who had grown up in the small town of Springer, New Mexico. Antoinette Downing came to Rhode Island in the 1930s and soon became an expert in the early architecture of the state. Since then, she has become the heart of the preservation movement in Rhode Island, and more than any other individual, she has defended and shaped the historic character of our cities and towns. For 50 years, she has done whatever has to be done to preserve the continuity of our connection with the past. She has written, lectured, and fought, not only to win, but to educate. The idea that emerged in our administration was that we'd, uh, there'd be a new doorway cut into the Capitol uh, on the ground level, and uh, I, in innocence at the time, thought that it seemed all right. Bango! Uh, it was uh, Antoinette uh, hove on the scene and straightened me out, and she was absolutely right. And she has now brought on a whole new generation of preservationists. She's the catalyst. There's great virtue for, uh, in preserving something that's old and significant. There's, there's a benefit for all the population, and there's a benefit indeed for the community and for the, the owner in the long run. Her book about Newport's architecture alerted people to one of the town's secret legacies. Not the mansions, not the churches and public buildings of the 18th century, but the houses of the people who had been shipwrights Coopers, carpenters, and cabinet makers of Newport's first golden age. Over 400 of these 18th century houses were still standing. That was remarkable enough, but even better, many of them still stood in streetscapes that hadn't changed in 200 years. Today, in Newport and Providence, the result of the preservation struggle has been a new understanding about how valuable the past can be. During its annual tour in Providence, the Preservation Society arranges to open private historic homes to visitors as a demonstration of what individual investment and public initiative can accomplish. The restoration and renovation of historic houses has become a focus for the revitalization of entire neighborhoods, and the reuse of commercial buildings around the state has shown that there is a long-term profit in rehabilitation. There is an appealing logic to this. The mill buildings, which once drove the area's economy and then later became symbols of its decline, are now valuable for reasons that have little to do with nostalgia and everything to do with practicality. These buildings with their stern geometry and spacious interiors were built to last, and their heavy fireproof construction makes them practical to rehabilitate. The Dyerville Mill on Manton Avenue has been converted into offices. The old Davall Rubber Company in Providence is now a shopping arcade. The old Hamilton Mill in Wickford has been turned into apartments. What Antoinette and her allies have demonstrated is that preservation is not only good for the soul, it's also good for business. Throughout the state, more and more people are aware that practical difficulties of preservation are more than outweighed by the advantages. I think people should spend more time and, and take the effort of realizing what you have here. 
I mean, you know, I, I just, I have a fear of, of 20 years from now seeing this building being leveled for condos. And, you know, my grandchildren aren't going to get the benefit of it. And it's happening all over the island. It's happening all over the state. And unfortunately, if people don't start to realize and start saving some of it, we're, out, we're in trouble. Because you're never going to build a building like this again. You couldn't afford to. Sometimes we take for granted the buildings that have been saved and forget how close we've come to losing structures that are now familiar landmarks. This Beaux-Arts building, so fashionable and imposing in 1878, seemed like an embarrassing dowager 100 years later. And the Providence City Hall, incredibly enough, was scheduled to be demolished. Today, its elegance has been carefully restored. The Providence Arcade, Warren and Buckland's Greek Revival masterpiece, could easily have become a parking lot if an energetic city administration had not decided to save it. The Wilcox building in Providence had been gutted by fire and was scheduled to be torn down in 1976, but a combination of public and private initiatives saved this polychrome Gothic Revival office building. The Woods Gary Mansion on Providence's east side was scheduled to be torn down by the Rhode Island School of Design, but now it houses a student gallery and the office of RISD's president. The Kazanjian block on Newport's Bellevue Avenue is an important commercial structure by Richard Morris Hunt, Newport's premier social architect. After a fire, it too was going to be torn down until concerned citizens stepped in to save it. Arsonists tried some unofficial urban renewal on Union Station and threatened to undo the city's attempt to make it an anchor for new development. Now safely restored, it's a symbol of determination. Buildings that weren't actually demolished might be hidden away covered up or kept out of sight, like a batty aunt. The old Providence Journal building on Westminster Street was a wonderful confection of Beaux-Arts design. Then, in the 1950s, it was modernized. Restored, this is the building today. And the Providence Public Library, another grand Beaux-Arts dom, had this modern annex attached to it like a curtain, cutting it off from the city it served. Today, with a new consciousness about how we experience architecture, it's undergoing a facelift and renovation. Ironically, Providence's long economic depression saved the essential city core from being destroyed. The decaying wharves and warehouses along the river, an embarrassment during the 1940s and 50s, are now valuable commercial property. In the financial district and downtown, buildings from different eras still carry on a healthy colloquy with each other sometimes arguing, sometimes agreeing. They are a backdrop to the large-scale development taking place around the capital. And over here at the foot of College Hill, the city is uncovering a valuable resource that's been invisible for years. When the concrete decking over the Providence River is removed, the city will lose the dubious distinction of having the world's second widest bridge, but the state will gain a new waterfront at its historic heart. For the first time since the earliest settlers started parceling out this land in the 17th century, the public will have access to the river. But the story is not one of unalloyed success. Take Newport. In the last 20 years, hundreds of homes and public buildings have been restored and renovated. But in the 60s, the city was one of the last willing victims of a policy of urban renewal that would sacrifice almost anything to that little tin god, the automobile. The price for saving Newport was a network of roads that drastically alter the city's character. The waterfront is bustling, but now a four-lane autobahn cuts through the downtown. Between May and October, it's a parking lot. And to funnel bridge traffic efficiently into town, planners cut a highway through the point, one of the most intact and coherent 18th century neighborhoods in the country. Today, we have equally difficult choices. What can we do with the outlet? It's actually three buildings erected as business expanded over the years. Each section is held together by bands of windows grouped under arched bays. It occupies a crucial downtown block, and it's been a part of the memory of thousands of Rhode Islanders. And how about the Veterans Memorial Auditorium? Is it an eyesore or an opportunity? 
Not everything that should be saved is grand and enormous. There should be a place in our hearts for roadside follies, like 1930s gas stations and the famous forlorn milk bottle in Lincoln. Some choices are easier and more manageable than others. Do we have the imagination to save this, the Cranston Street Armory? Inside, it's a vast open space. But it's 80 years old this year, and it's beginning to fall apart. It's certainly a gift from the past, but it's like inheriting a castle. What do you do with it? And can we afford to keep it? The question is really, how can we afford not to keep it? Its oversized battlements loom over the rooftops like a child's fantasy, and it provides a visual anchor for this part of the city. Around it, the long-neglected neighborhood is slowly coming back to life. It's not just a question of preserving the past. What are we building today? Contemporary architecture has given us some good buildings around the state and some turkeys. Pick your favorite. There's a lot of pressure right now for Rhode Island to develop its cities and towns, its coastline and its open spaces, but we have to be careful. Do we want the bay ringed with condominiums? Are we willing to trade our farmland and woods for a carpet of developments with cute country names? Can we afford to lose the essentially human scale of our cities and towns? It might help to think of architecture not as a collection of isolated monuments and historic houses, but as the fabric of buildings and spaces that gives Rhode Island its special character. That character will survive as long as we remember we all have a stake in shaping the built environment, because for better or worse, it is shaping us. Thank you. 